time for Voice of Indy. Your hosts today are Beam Weeks, author, producer, and marketing monster for independent multimedia publisher Fresh Ink Group, and Stephen G, author, producer, composer, and publisher for Fresh Ink Group. Hey, good evening. Happy Wednesday, everybody, and I hope everybody's staying safe and warm. Welcome to the Voice of Indie podcast, show number 27. I am your host, Beam Weeks, and my co-host, as always, is over there, Mr. Stephen G's. How are you doing tonight, Stephen? I am just thrilled to be here. It's a fine day. We are now in the month of February, well into this year, 2021, and it looks like this year's just going to stick, and we're going to keep going with it. But all right. for today's podcast, I want to remind all of our listeners out there that you are welcome to call in, talk to today's guest, razz him, harass him, make fun of him, call him out, whatever you want to do by calling 516-453-9902. That's 516-453-9902. And you can also add uh, comments or questions for tonight's guest at, on Twitter using the hashtag Fresh Ink Group. So remember to put that in there, hashtag Fresh Ink Group, and we will see that, and uh, we will read your comment or your question. And today's show, like all of our shows, can be found at FreshInkGroup.com. From now till the end of time, go on over there, click the podcast tab, scroll down, and look at all those pretty colorful placards that are in there for all the different shows. I'm telling you, those placards are worth a look, even if you don't listen to a podcast. Go over there and have a look at the placards. But go ahead and click a podcast while you're there. And you can also find them on our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, Fresh Ink Group, and uh, check them out. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe. Hit those like buttons and all that good stuff. YouTube, Fresh Ink Group. But you can also find them at beamweeks.com underneath the podcast tab and stephengs.com underneath the podcast tab. Now, when I was in there a couple of days ago and looked, we were up to 106 subscribers, and it's kind of been stuck on that number for a week or two here. So call all your friends, call your family, tell everybody at church, get on uh, social media, and see if you can help us get that subscriber count up to, you know, like 108, 109, something that would really, really rattle our world. Yeah, and while you're uh, over there... uh... On, when you go to the uh, homepage at Fresh Ink Group, if, while you're over there looking at the podcast, at the bottom of the, the homepage uh, at FreshInkGroup.com, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. And uh, this is a, it's a cool newsletter. We don't inundate you with a whole bunch of them, but we send them out uh, once a week to announce the podcast, the info, who's going to be the guest, and all that stuff. And uh, uh, once in a while, we even throw out. Uh, pot or a uh, newsletter that deals with new releases and things like that too so uh, get over there and sign up for the newsletter as well now we're sitting here looking at twitter right now and we see fresh ink group member bernard fung has been uh, out there that today promoting tonight's podcast we want to remind all of you please help us do that we put these things out uh, through five different twitter accounts fresh ink group Stephen g's beam weeks voice of indy and uh uh, G's writer at G's writer. Plus we have some friends who we help manage their accounts, other fresh ink group members like Doc Shearer, Mark Allen, North one, Larry F Hunter. Uh, anytime you see any of these podcast promos, please retweet them. We've got them going out on uh, several Facebook accounts, several Instagram accounts. And of course we try to blanket Twitter right up to showtime. Yeah. And speaking of Twitter, Ver Wayne Greenhoe is out there already. He said, uh, harass, Harangue? Sounds like going to my (laughs) in-laws. Okay, tonight's guest is author and writer coach Matthew Harms. Uh, Stephen, you want to tell us a little bit about our guest? Matthew Harms is a coach, author, screenwriter, and professional ghostwriter. As a coach, he works with both aspiring and established writers, who want to retain control of the creative process but need a different perspective to help push past barriers and achieve their desired literary outcome. In the role of ghostwriter, Matthew mainly partners with successful business leaders who are seeking to become more of an authority in their specific industry by conveying their knowledge and expertise in the most compelling way possible. 
He also has a passion for working with professionals who have a message of growth or inspiration, but lack the time or ability to effectively relate it in writing. And with that, welcome to the show, Matthew. Uh, welcome to Voice of Indy. Thank you guys so much for having me. And would you do you have anything you want to add to that bio? Something uh, Stephen might have forgot? Like Left where off? you're from? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, where are you from? That, I think it sounds like he's got my DNA samples, but uh, I'm originally <laughs> from the Bronx, New York. And uh, right now reside reside in Westchester County, um, right north of the Bronx. So you know, took that giant leap and moved up in the world. Ooh. So you're right there where all of that snow got dumped. Why don't you share a little bit about that? How how much snow are you looking at out there right now? Uh, it was about 21 inches at last count. Um, considering how much I had to shovel, I easily shoveled myself out of a snowy grave. <laughs> yeah, that was going to be my question. Shovel, snowblower, or condo? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, definitely not a condo. And every year I joke that I should get the snowblower. And I refuse because we had a power outage during Superstorm Sandy. Um, oh, my goodness, probably eight, nine years ago now. We bought a generator right afterwards and then never lost power again. So I figured if I buy a snowblower, the same thing will happen. And now I'm starting to wonder, even if I do that and never use it, it's probably still a good investment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah definitely. Huh. So are, are you a, a lifelong New Yorker? I am. Born and raised in the Bronx. Um, traveled a little bit. Always said I would never leave after this last snowstorm. That, that may have been the straw that broke the, uh, the New Yorkers back, and I, I am looking for sunnier pastures. But for now, born and raised in, the New, in New York. Well, you know, that's the thing about a snowblower is not only is it, you know, quick and efficient for helping clear your area, but you can be very popular in your neighborhood if you, like, get the old lady across the street or the uh, the people next door who work two jobs and all that. And it only takes a couple extra minutes just to run a little further down that sidewalk. And then everybody will bake you things and bring you presents and thank you and just think that you're the best thing since sliced bread or shirt pockets. You know, in theory, that sounds very, very uh, plausible, except where I live in Yonkers, it's known as the City of Hills. Most of my neighbors, you couldn't operate a snowblower on their property if you wanted to. It, it's all Ooh. manual. Wow. wow. So, uh, that still doesn't give me an excuse for why I don't have one. I actually have a level driveway, and I still shovel it out by hand. So I guess I'm just yeah. a glutton for punishment. Yeah, something. So what kind of education you got? You been to school? Um, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> That's usually when people ask me, like, what the hell are you talking about? But um, I, I got a bachelor's degree in finance from Iona College, which, you know, not a major university, but fairly well known in this area. And I only did so because when I was younger and told everyone that I wanted to be a writer, I was laughed at, told to get a reality check. You can't pay your bills being a writer. And to go get a job, uh, you know, go to college, get a degree, get a good job. But that's where the advice stopped. So yeah. I looked at people working on Wall Street, thought it was a good road, and uh, 20 years later, have a degree that looks nice on my wall, but I've done nothing with. Wow. Uh, yeah, you know, all that discouragement saying you can't make a living at writing, you can. Especially in today's world, when you've got the world at your fingertips through the computer, through the Internet. But there's that whole marketing kind of thing. Uh, have you picked up any any skills at marketing that that have helped you to, uh, you know, get your your product out there, your name out there? Well, Beam, I think you hit two things on the head. One, back when you know when I was getting into the age of going to college, the the playing field wasn't quite as level as it is now. Um, and people's beliefs were much more limited in, in my circle of, well, this is just what everyone's always done. So it didn't seem quite as plausible. Fast forward to today, I still hate marketing and um, don't do a whole lot with it myself, but I have realized the importance of it, um, you know, with all the tools that are out there, especially the self-publishing platforms, folks like yourself um, and Stephen who have these, these podcasts, my own podcast, Twitter, uh, social media experts who handle these kinds of things. And I've learned that I don't have to be an expert at everything, just 
kind of surround myself with people who are good at what they do, and the rest will happen. It's a good good plan. So speaking of surrounding yourself, uh, tell us about your family. So um, right now, really, it's just myself, my wife, my two kids. We, uh, we live here in Yonkers. My father still lives in the Bronx where we grew up. My, um, my only other blood relative is my brother who lives about two hours northeast of here in Pennsylvania where they got even more snow. So he, he's the crazier one of the family. Um, <laughs> he lives out there with his wife, his wife and three kids. And um, on the side, when I'm not writing, we actually run a real estate investment company where we own a number of different rental properties out there where you're not paying New York prices. And that's about it. Very, very small, tight-knit family, uh, or as tight-knit as you can be when there's only three of you. Mm. Your kids, boy and girl? No, two boys. My oldest one is Jax. He's, uh, he's seven. He is going to be a black belt in Taekwondo this year. Yeah. And that just, blow, yeah, that just blows my mind. I took two karate classes when I was his age and wanted nothing to do with it. But if you look <laughs> at pictures of us side by side, he's also in shape. And the only shape I was in was round. And my youngest one is uh, three and a half. His name is Cash. He just started taking Taekwondo. And he hits harder than any grown man who's ever hit me. So I'm kind of hoping he doesn't pursue it any further. Wow. <laughs> so I guess we can we can uh, we can say that Taekwondo is your hobby. But uh, what other hobbies? What hobbies do you have? What do you do when you're not busy working or doing the real estate thing? So Taekwondo is their hobby. I have literally no, uh, I don't want to say no athletic ability, but that is definitely not my cup of tea. My hobbies really, it's, it's writing. Writing is by far the thing that gets me going. And that sounds strange from the guy who writes professionally, but there is just a totally different dynamic to ghostwriting or coaching others through their work and actually getting to sit down and work on my own projects. So either my own novels, uh, my own personal development books, screenplays that usually don't get the attention I want to give them because I'm busy doing everyone else's since that's what pays the bills. Yeah, um, I, I, I can I can uh, understand that with the ghost writing. I've I've done uh, a I ghost wrote a one project for somebody, and uh, it's nothing like writing my own stuff. Um, I, I don't see, see that as a hobby for me. That's, you know, writing is breathing. It's, it's, I've got a, I got things in my head that's got to get out. So it's, it's not really a hobby for me, but uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the dynamics yeah. of ghostwriting is, is definitely different because uh, you're telling somebody else's story and it's got to follow, you know, their route. And uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely different. You know, so you've that's met- an interesting point, and I've never kind of looked at it like that. I guess that makes me fairly boring because outside of writing, it would be reading. Um, and, and at one point, you know, the game Civilization was was a giant hobby of mine until I realized a bit of a problem. So I just went back to writing and reading. <laughs> so what other kinds of things are you doing for generating income? I've, I heard you talk about a couple of things when we talked yesterday, besides being a heartless landlord. <laughs> you know, I'm not even going to touch that one, Stephen, because unfortunately that, that seems to be the narrative that those in power tell. Um, <laughs> that, that's really not the case. We're going to leave that one alone. I also am a licensed real estate agent here in New York, so I do help other first-time home buyers um, and, and other people looking to buy or sell their homes realize that dream. I recently started a financial service company because if the 20 years I spent suffering in finance and banking wasn't enough to make me realize that I was crazy, I decided now that I don't have to do it, why not just go back and do it because I can. So I did that recently, a partner um, and myself who I do real estate with, and that's gotten off the ground fairly successfully. And now that I'm sitting here saying all this, I'm like, wait, when do I have time to sleep? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I don't sleep that much. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, who, and that's probably whom why you... I couldn't answer. That's probably why I couldn't answer Dean's question about a hobby, because I, I really need to make time for a hobby. <laughs> so 
So whom do you answer to? Uh, right now, nobody. Uh huh. Although one correction, I do answer to my ghostwriting clients uh, and their deadlines. Outside yeah. of that, nobody. So you like being your own boss, doing your own thing. I do. I do. Um, you know, I, I disparage the 20 years I spent in the corporate world a lot, but I will say that nothing is a waste of time. And the one thing I learned uh, from all of that time was that I cared way too much about things that made other people money and made other yep. people successful and sleep well at night. And finally came to the realization of if I put only, if I put half that effort into doing something for myself, there's no way to fail. Ah, man, yeah, you're speaking my language. I, I've been that route too, uh, caring caring, and looking just, just to do a, a great job and it's making other people money and I couldn't even get a raise, you know. I'm, I, I remember asking uh, even for like a 50 cent an hour raise just because, you know, I asked for a couple of dollars and they turned that down. I said, well, anything, 50 cents. And well, we're not in the position to give any raises right now. And that's when I decided I was going to start looking for something different, pumping all those years into this place and helping them make money. And it's, you know, they weren't looking out for, for the little guys there, but they were sure using us for, for, you know, their purposes. Uh, we do have, you know that, that, go ahead. I'm sorry, but I was going to say that, that light bulb went off for me in a similar situation when I got a performance review and I was a top ranked producer in the market, you know, like top 5% of 200, um, you know, every category you can imagine, I was just in the top and my performance review came around. Anyone who's worked corporate knows usually everyone falls into the meets expectations. And when I put up an argument of, I couldn't at least get a high meet, and I was given examples of, well, you know, to get a high meet, you, you could have possibly cleaned the toilets or shoveled the snow from the front of the bank. That's when I realized that this wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we do have a, another comment from uh, Verwain Greenho on, on Twitter. Um, he says, as if the writing process wasn't enough, the process of promoting, holding auditions for Audible, and all the rest of the circus can be a real balancing act. And I agree. Uh, the, the, what you were talking about, Matthew, about the, uh, the marketing that you hate that, uh, and that's the most important aspect of it. The writing part for me is the easy part. But that, that marketing, promoting it and all that, it's trying to find what works, where's the silver bullet, and you spend a lot of time on just on that stuff. And it, it can be a drag at times. And it can be real frustrating and it can be depressing. Yeah, you on Twitter. 1,000% you correct. I, I would rather lock myself in my office and write you a 1,000 pages before I'll send 10 tweets. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Robert Williscroft over on Twitter is adding marketing. What's that? <laughs> And you got another comment from Verwain Greenho too. He's saying, my wife and I are looking at moving back to Florida. All the snow we have had lately has convinced her that while it may be beautiful here in the summer, winter is for serious youpers only. Youper as in uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan. She thought she was serious, but 30 inches of snow has changed her mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, tell him, please let me know if he's able to accomplish that and how he did it because I'm right behind yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then Beam, you want to get Robert's other comment? Uh, sure. Uh, he said, uh, Robert Willis-Croft says, I thought you were married. I think you report to someone every day at, at least. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we go to our first commercial, one one last thing about your uh, uh, what you've been doing here, uh, Matthew. Uh, I heard you say something about your approach to clients. You like to under promise and over deliver. I like that under promise and over deliver. Okay. This commercial that we're going to play is called princess Lil. It's a chapter book for children. Those of you who are regular listeners, we had its author, Nell Cooper on our podcast a few weeks ago. We just made uh, during that show, we promised her we would make a video about the book. Well, we have, and it's now up on YouTube. Go to the Fresh Ink Group channel and look for the Princess Lil video that was just put up there. 
and uh, we're going to hear just the audio portion of it right now. Princess Lil is a sad pony. Her little girl grew up and went away. Now Lil is in a scary place with lots of mean ponies. A fun furry farm cat called Taffy and a nice roan horse named Pearly try to help. It even looks like Princess Lil might have a chance to cheer up special needs children too. But she is already too hurt and too sick. Princess Lil is about the differences between loyal friends and those who bully others. It shows the power of caring about ourselves and the people who look out for us. Is it too late for a sad pony in a scary place? The answer just might depend on how much we all love Princess Lil. Grab copies of Princess Lil for all the little girls in your life. Available worldwide in softcover and all ebook editions. Or you can share the audiobook as read by author Nell Cooper. Princess Lil is proudly published by Fresh Ink Group. And there you go. Yeah, like uh, Stephen said, there's a book trailer over on the Fresh Ink Group YouTube channel. Go over there, check it out, you know, smash that like button, and uh, leave a comment, too. And uh, so the author and knows. And subscribe. And subscribe. So the author knows <laughs> that you're out there and you've seen seen the, the trailer. Yeah, I'm um, determined to get that subscriber count up here. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's we're trying to build something here, so... That's the next step. That, that falls, Another break. That falls into that marketing category we were speaking about, right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, now, let's change gears and get into your actual writing, uh, Matthew. You you do quite a bit of different stuff, screenplays, nonfiction, fiction, ghostwriting. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the stuff that you've written uh, and uh, – um, Kind of the, the, a little bit of the background of that. Yeah, like maybe how you got into essay writing way back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell that story. So, well, I guess I'll, I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version of how I wound up here by filling in the blanks. So as I mentioned, I, I always wanted to be a writer from the time, even before high school, I would, while well, everyone else was out playing or, you know, video games were coming out, I would write in my notebook. Um, looking back on it now, they were probably terrible, and I'm glad I can't find them. But as I got into high school, I realized I, I had a knack for just delivering messages. And my senior year, I made a business out of writing term papers for other people. I'm pretty sure I'm past the statute of limitations that they can fail me uh, or get me. So I'm going to you know, openly admit this. And out of a class of 20 in my senior year film class, I think I wrote 16 term papers, 15 of them all got B's or better, I got a D, and the reason I got the D was because I wrote mine 3 o'clock in the morning the day before it was due, since I was the only non-paying client and clearly put myself last. (laughs) (laughs) So my parents weren't happy about the D, but they didn't seem to care that I wasn't asking for money that month. (laughs) <laughs> that uh, that didn't seem to shift the the belief. I caved in, went to, you know, got that finance degree we spoke about. Fast forward 2018, I decided I was done. I couldn't take banking anymore. I was interviewing all of these people who had no life skills, and I felt so bad for them. So I wrote my first book on the suggestion of one of my best friends, my, my kid's godfather, um, and, a, and a co-manager who was like, why don't you write and tell them what they're doing wrong? So the book employed started out as just a how to interview guide and it quickly morphed into, well, no, before I even teach you how to interview, let me make sure that you're aware of that. You even want to interview for this job, make sure that this is something you want to do. So it became a manual of figure out what you want to do before you apply for a job. Then if you are really sure you want to do it, here's how you interview skills. Here's how you follow up, be memorable. Um, I published it quite shortly after, not thanks to book sales because I still don't have that marketing piece down. Uh, but right after that, I put out Grow Up, No Really, which was kind of, of a follow-up to my anti-schooling because I wasted all of this money on a finance degree, and they didn't teach me how to balance a checkbook, how to understand a car lease, how to negotiate an apartment. All of that I learned on my own. So I put all of these real-life concepts that school doesn't teach you into Grow Up. 
as that was going on, I had other people approach me like, wow, you, you're pretty good at conveying the things you've learned. How can you help me do that? Um, next thing you know, the ghostwriting was born, and I revisited a file on my computer that I stopped writing once I got into my junior year of college because that, that life took over, uh, which was a fiction novel about a religious fanatical serial killer. I swear no relation to my own life. We're just going to leave that one there. <laughs> um, and I published that on Amazon in October of this year. And since then, I mean, unfortunately, that's the last thing I've written of my own in a while. And that was kind of a personal passion project to prove to myself that I could actually get that work out there and kind of prove everyone wrong. Like, no, I did it. That, that book you were saying couldn't happen, happened. And now I, I've been blessed after COVID happened with Zoom and this network of incredible people I've met through the Thrivers 360 Mastermind Group of business coaches, public speakers, entrepreneurs who have a need to get their message out and they just don't have the time or the resources. And I've stepped in and offered my services to bring their message to others who might not get to hear it otherwise. Now, this uh, the book employed a career readiness manual. Um, from what I know of that, that's in two two parts, right? There's basically two main sections. What what is the difference between those? So it's actually three main sections. The first section is the whole, hey, figure out what you want to do in life. Um, give it some thought. Don't just jump in and get a job because it pays well. Don't listen to your your friend's uncle's cousin. Think about where you want to be in 30 years, and if the person you're listening to isn't where you want to be, then please don't listen to them um, because the only place you're going to wind up in 30 years is where they are, stuck and miserable. But once you've gotten past section one is and well, identified, wait, wait, okay, wait, yeah. wait, wait, before you get past section one, I'm very interested <laughs> in that. How do you help people sort that out? Because that's a huge thing for people, high school, college age, trying to sort out those different directions that they want to go. And I've not known very many people in my time who were very good at it at those ages, making all kinds of decisions. I mean, you know, they go into finance, for example, and then wind up not having a career in finance. How do you help people sort all that stuff out? I mean, do you have like worksheets, exercises, you know, things to, to go through? You ask them questions. Uh, what, what's the process? I'm going to move past that. I think that was a veiled shot at me, Stephen, but we're going to let that go. <laughs> <laughs> There are most certainly worksheets at the end of each chapter. Uh, there's an emphasis on taking the time that a lot of people won't tell you of sitting down and just saying, hey, what am I like doing? And what am I good at doing? And then thinking, is there any way I can combine those into a way to make money, into a career, into a side hustle? Uh, just because it's not conventional, like we said earlier, now with writing. You know, not every writer can make a living by writing books but there are so many more opportunities than there used to be that that whole first section is really based on some type of introspection and getting to know yourself and not just jumping into something for the money or because someone else told you to do it. Really, even if, even if you find out later it wasn't what you wanted to do, at least looking back and saying when you did it, you truly thought that's what you wanted to do and you can't point the finger at somebody else. Definitely. Yeah, yeah way, it's, it's called taking responsibility. <laughs> way way back in the yeah. day in an earlier life when I was working on my master's degree, I used to get federal grants and set up programs of uh, employment readiness, training for high-risk uh, young adults, uh, risky populations, and things like that. And we found that that part of the process is one of the trickiest of all and that you can't just focus on the career. you got to focus on the person you got to find out what causes them to be stressed and how would their career paths affect those kinds of things? Uh, what kinds of things are they afraid of? What, uh, what would they most like to accomplish in their personal lives that maybe their professional lives could help them do? There's just so much of that stuff to sort out. And I found that when I would hire like uh, instructors or trainers to work with people, they would come away having figured out some of their own stuff too. In fact, I had one come, come to me one time and quit because she says, well, one of the things I figured out today was this isn't for me. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in that. There's a lot involved. That, that is such an amazing point. I, I think, and don't quote me because 
my memory is not that good. And you're like, you wrote it, you can't remember it. But that's like the example of someone who's like, I want to be a doctor. But they don't think or really understand all of the things that go into being a doctor. And like, you find out first day of medical school, you can't stand the sight of blood. Well, that's probably not going to work out too well for you. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that's an oddly poignant example for me because when I was uh, like pre high school, I kind of considered a, a career in the medical field, but by high school, uh, I went and talked to the counselor and learned, well, you're going to have to do chemistry and all these different things. And it was chemistry that made me decide maybe I wasn't interested in going that direction. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The, okay, those are the now, things people don't think about. Now I did I cut you off before you got to the other parts of uh employed a career readiness manual. After they figure that stuff out, what happens in part two? So part two is really just interviewing best practices, which I, I know there's been a ton of books written about, but this is kind of my own perspective for a new market where and this was prior to COVID, but we were interviewing at my firm. 80% of the candidates, their first interview was a virtual interview. And we were interviewing a lot of millennials who would kill it on camera. You know, they were comfortable. You, you, you watched it as a hiring manager, and you couldn't wait to bring them in. You're like, I'm hiring this person uh, before they even walk through the door. And then they sit across your desk. And it's like a completely different person. They have absolutely no social skills whatsoever. They can't look you in the eye. Um, they're like lost without their phone in their hands. So that whole second section is geared towards some old school, you know, body language um, and different tips. And then some new school, how to get through being uncomfortable outside of your comfort zone of not having a screen in front of you and actually having to interact with a person. Yeah, that seems to be a, a big thing, that the interaction thing. I noticed that a, a, amongst some of the younger people, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they do everything over social media now. Um, and there's that, that skill of, you know, meeting people and being a people person has kind of fallen by the wayside. Yeah, it's happened, and you see it. I saw it in the job world. You see it with younger people now with dating. Um, you name it. They just there's such a decreased ability to have an interpersonal relationship. If you go to a restaurant, and you've got a family sitting down to eat. I, I remember one particular instance. Uh, I think I even put this in the book. A family of five. They're all sitting there on their phones. As the waiter comes over, the only time they look up from their phones to order, they're all back at their phones. They're on their phones through dinner. There was absolutely no even familial interaction. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that myself. I just read a quote, and unfortunately, I don't remember who it was that, that put that quote out there. But this person talking about social media, he said, I don't believe we were meant to talk to everyone. <laughs> and I thought that says a lot because that's what we do. We we think we're, you know, we talk to all kinds of people online that even that we might not be working with them for like marketing purposes, but there's a comment that's made. So we got to jump in and throw a comment of our own in there. And then you got a conversation going on and more people jump in and we're talking to everybody online, but out there in the real world, we're not talking to anybody. Right, stick that same person in a networking meeting or a, or a business mixer, and they're the ones in the corner nursing their drink and doesn't don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> We've got a comment from Robert Williscroft over on Twitter. He says you have to add one more thing that's a must-do thing. Find the girl of your dreams and make sure she doesn't get away. Speaking for myself, speaking for himself, he waited way too long. Good advice, Robert. Yes, good advice. Just now yeah. tell me where where to find her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, she's not going to want to talk to you in person, Stephen, so you got to meet her online, I guess. That's yeah, the way yeah. they do it now. <laughs> All right, let's interrupt for another quick commercial and then get back and we'll talk to Matthew about his next book, Growing Up No Really. This commercial is about one of my favorite books by co-host Beam Weeks called Jazz Baby. All right, thanks. While all of Mississippi bakes in the scorching summer of 1925, sudden orphanhood wraps its icy embrace around Emily Ann Baby Teagarden, a pretty young teen. 
taken in by an ant bent on ridding herself of this unexpected burden. Baby Tea Garden plots her escape using the only means at her disposal, a voice that brings church ladies to righteous tears and makes both angels and devils take notice. I'm going to New York City to sing jazz, she brags to anybody who'll listen. But the Big Apple, well, it's an awful long way from that dry patch of earth she's always called home. So when the smoky stages of New Orleans speakeasies give a whistle, offering all sorts of shortcuts, Emily Ann soon learns it's the whorehouses and opium dens that can sidetrack a girl and dim a spotlight. And knowing the wrong people can snuff it out. Jazz Baby just wants to sing, not fight to stay alive. Jazz Baby is available now in dust jacketed hardcover, soft cover, and all ebook editions worldwide. Jazz Baby by Beam Weeks is proudly published by Fresh Ink Group. Yeah, and I just want to add in there if you want to get a good deal on the, the hardcover, go to Barnes and Noble. Amazon, they just they play around with the price over there, and it's it's a lot cheaper at Barnes and Noble. But the uh, paperback and the uh, ebook are cheaper at Amazon. So there you go. So we're talking to Matthew Harms of Pen for Hire, uh, ghostwriter, author, uh, investor, uh, slumlord, yeah, you name it. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, he's uh, he's got some rental properties and, and does some investing and whatnot. We're taking phone calls, 516-453-9902, and we're monitoring Twitter. Put hashtag Fresh Ink Group in your tweet, and we probably read it on the air. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, talk about Grow Up. No, really. What's this all about? So as I alluded to earlier, that is about all of the life skills that we are not taught growing up. Uh, no matter what school you go to, and, you know, I'm sure there's some people who are like, no, I learned that. But I, I went to a fairly good high school. I got a, co- a bachelor's degree in finance, and I did not learn how to balance a checkbook. I didn't learn about all of the behind-the-scenes stuff that goes on in the banking world until I worked in a bank how to understand a car lease and how they rob you, how to understand how mortgage payments work and um, discount points and homeowner's insurance, life insurance. Uh, There's about 15 topics in the book, and I probably could have kept going, but I was trying to keep it geared toward more um, graduating high school to early 20 age group of just the things that can wind up setting someone back so far by making a poor investment without having just a little bit of knowledge. You you didn't need a high level master class, just knowing, you know, the difference between putting down a few extra dollars on your mortgage every month or not leasing a car instead of owning it because you'll never be out from under a car payment. Yeah. All worthwhile uh, uh, things to learn. And so many of us learn those things the hard way, you know, just going through them. I know that was for me learning how to balance a, a checkbook, for instance, and the whole insurance and, and all of that stuff. I, I just learned it just by going out there and doing it. But I mean, I had good parents too, that, you know, kind of helped me along the way too. And I know a lot of people might not have that. Well, and that's just it being, um, you know, my parents were doing what they knew too, and they were good in their instance. They didn't know a whole lot about insurance. Neither one of them had a, you know, a college level education, especially not in that, um, in that segment. And too many people were trained to listen to other people that we think are experts, kind of like my example in employed of don't take career advice from a seven year old janitor who tells you not to be an astronaut because it's not possible. Well, if you want to be a seven year old janitor, listen to the seven year old janitor. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Valid point. Yeah, I've long, long, long thought that uh, those kinds of things should be taught very, very young. One thing that stood out to me was when I was 12 uh, in our seventh grade class, we had this book that was, you know, it's like a story about these people living on an island and they have to try to barter some things back and forth. And then they decide to use seashells as currency. And and one thing leads to another. And by chapter 15, it's uh, interest rates and amortization and you know, building a hut and financing it for the other guy. And I'm telling you, I learned a lot going through that book, 12 years old. And 
right there. I picked up all kinds of skills about someday getting credit and managing credit cards and things like that. And I just, I wondered why more of that kind of stuff isn't taught. And, and the other thing that's bothered me over the years that I thought just has not been taught nearly enough is just plain, basic, critical thinking, learning how to yeah. evaluate, evaluate information that you're given, evaluate the source doing the legwork to go verify things and find out what the context is or if there's other interpretations and coming to intelligent opinions rather than just parroting whatever the echo chamber tells you. And I've, I've thought about this all my life and I'm telling you the last few years, it's mind boggling the kind of information, misinformation and and just plain idiocy that goes around out there and people swallow it without ever making any effort at all to evaluate it because they don't know how. They were never taught that stuff. I had to get to college to learn a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know what? And, and that those research papers that was, that I was writing, I, pro- I did them all a disservice because those are probably 16 people now who did not learn critical thinking skills because they didn't have to go out and research. Someone did it for them. Now, you just really... Okay. You there, Matthew? <laughs> Did we lose you, Matthew? You dropped out. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, you didn't hear anything I said? Uh, just no. Just the last few words. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Go on. I, I said you made me feel bad. You made me feel bad about myself, Stephen, because now I realize all those term papers I wrote, <laughs> I was taking away people's uh, lesson in how to think critically and research things. Well, they didn't they didn't want to learn it right then or they weren't ready to learn it. And by the way, I'm going to need those 15 names. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, we, we have a couple of callers on, on the line here. So let's uh, take uh, these calls and uh, see what they have to say. Hello, caller. You are on the air. Uh, what is your name and where are you calling from? You talking about me? Yes, I'm talking about you. How are you doing? You. I'm doing well. What's up, Matt? How are you? You know who this is? I do not, but apparently you know me. You was the editor of the History of the Coney Island Basketball Book. Delbert Prince, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How you doing? So you can how vouch you doing, for this guy. guy. So, Stephen and Beam, I uh, I helped Delbert with the editing, formatting, and publishing of his two books on Coney Island basketball in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are they still available out there for sale? Yes, it's on Amazon. All right. You want to spell, the, spell your name for us? D-E-L-B-E-R-T. Delbert Prince is my last name. P R I N C E. Okay, that's Delbert Prince over on Amazon. Go have a look, people, and see what's uh, what's out there about Coney Island basketball. Yes, I got I got reviews on on part one, part two. I don't know why people didn't write reviews, but I I got credit for it. I, I had good reviews verbally, but I didn't get it. It hasn't been written. Hmm. So you're endorsing the I'm, help that you got from Matthew. Yes. What was the best um, part? How did he help you the most? He helped me the most with um, making sure my um, my points was understanding that it was it was clear. He wanted to make sure that um, the argument was was fully understanding for the public to, to un- when they read the book. He also helped me out with punctuation. He also helped me out with um, grammar which is expected because you don't want to um, advertise a book with poor grammar. He, he mm-hmm. helped me in a lot of ways. He also helped me with the, the front cover with him and his artists. Wow. Total, con- total book author consulting. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I mean, the first yeah. book was the hardest Delbert book to written, written, but the second book was just a smooth transition. And, and I got to tell you guys, Delbert was one who, I mean, he lived through the error, but he also did his research, which Stephen was just talking about. He came equipped with newspaper articles um, and a ton of facts and figures that weren't just pulled out of thin air. 
Good. Good. Right. All right. Yeah, well, right. thank you. Thanks for calling in, Delbert. You're yeah, welcome. And um, I want to let you know that um, I have a comic book coming out in in April. Oh. Okay. We need to hook Tell you up. Tell us a little more about that, then. Louis Cruz, our uh, yeah. member. Okay. Um, it's called Coney Island Mix. It's um, it's mostly it's, it's the point of the the comic book is going to talk about what um plays in Coney Island playing basketball against each other during the daytime. And I also created superheroes who's going to fight enemies at night. It's a 46-page comic book. All right. April, uh, huh? Yes. And that'll okay. be on Amazon be... as well? Yes. Mark your calendars, yes. people. Okay, we got yes. to move on to the next Delbert. caller. All right, thanks, Delbert. Nice talking to you, Delbert. All right, we'll we'll have you back next week calling in again, right, Delbert? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. See you then. Thanks. Thanks, Albert. No problem. All right. Uh, here we go. Next caller. Hello, caller. Uh, where are you calling from, and what's your name? Um, am I on? Yes, yeah, you're on. Okay. Okay. This is Nell Cooper. Uh, hi, Nell. Hi, Nell. Yes. Hi, and I just wanted to say how much I'm enjoying the energy of, of the interview. It's, it's really fun. It's really positive. Um, just wanted to, to make a statement to really encourage people to consider Toastmasters International. We talked about marketing and learning the skills of public speaking. 90% of learning those skills is learning to listen. And all of those things are such wonderful contributing factors to writing. So I just wanted to put in a boost for Toastmasters. Oh, excellent advice. Excellent. Yeah. And, every and you're right. I go to a, every time and, I go to a writer's you know conference, they talk about go to Toastmasters. Yeah, good. When, and Nell is absolutely correct. As a ghostwriter, one of the hardest things uh, really is listening and not so much the writing because we, we have to pay attention to everything that the client is saying and not just what they're saying, how they're saying it and how they intend it. Um, that, that is the basis of every good argument, every compelling story. So I, I completely agree with her. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Nell. You're welcome. Have a good night. All right. You Thank too. Thank you, Nell. Okay. So, uh, I think it's t- time to roll one more commercial and then uh, come back and talk about pen for hire. And for our, yeah, okay. And this, this one, this one would be a fantasy patch. Announcing from Fresh Ink Group by acclaimed author Stephen G's Fantasy Patch. Picture this: Dante Rowanick creates ad campaigns, reveling in the fine art of rendering his concepts on million-dollar canvases, financed by big-budget clients. Intoxicated by the sheer power of directing public opinion, he dares wage war against the conglomerate behind a worldwide antidepressant increasingly associated with sporadic violence. To juxtapose his images with reality, he enlists a mixed palette of business tycoons, his fiancée attorney, a team of corporate spy soldiers of fortune, one resurgent news anchor, and the best TV production crew in all of Chicago. But the sharp lines dividing perception from truth begin to blur when the darker motives shaping mass media come to light. Forced to re-examine the ethics of designer pharmacology, Dante is painted into a corner, his future about to be erased as patients die. Clients lie, and unhealthy doses of murder prove too hard to swallow. Too late to whitewash the stain of deceit, Dante must decide who deserves to appear in his picture. The true subject, an unfinished self-portrait, way past its own deadline. It's not what you see, not what you get. Let Dante show you how. With a fantasy patch. Read Fantasy Patch now in print or ebook, available worldwide. 
proudly published by the Fresh Ink Group. We had a lot of fun making that video, and if you want to see what we did, get over to the YouTube Fresh Ink Group channel and make sure you like it and subscribe while you're there. Yes, definitely. Now, Pen for Hire offers premier ghostwriting and writing analysis services for individuals and organizations. They specialize in working with business owners and entrepreneurs who want to increase the value of their brand by having a book or other compelling content that endorses them as an industry-leading expert in their field. Pen for Hire also helps published and aspiring authors take their work to the next level or get to market for the first time. So, Matthew, tell us a little bit about this. So, the concept actually has been evolving for about two years now. Um, And as you heard from Delbert, who called in earlier, when I started Pen for Hire, I was more geared toward a product-based outcome, which was, hey, you wrote a book or you got all of the bones for a book, I'll help you put it together, I will go over it for plot, argument, you know, context, grammar, everything he mentioned, and then some help you format it, package it, get a cover done, and we'll publish it. And as time went on, I realized that I'm not so much driven by the product, but the process. So I started taking on projects that required a lot more work than just editing and formatting. More of, hey, I have a half a book written, where should I go from here? Or I have an outline, what are your suggestions? And that grew to what it is now of I work with clients ranging from they have an entire book outlined and they just want someone to put the meat on the bones, or they have an entire book in their heads and I spend a couple hours a week extracting it on Zoom, transcribing it, putting it in their, you know, in their own words and rearranging it so that that knowledge comes out in an effective, compelling written way, as opposed to just a verbal diarrhea brain dump. Yeah. The, I know a lot of, of uh, people who, you know, they know I'm an author. They've never written anything, but they'll, that's what they say. I've got this book in my head, this great idea for a book. And you know, the first thing I tell them to do is sit down and, and uh, outline it how you want it to go. Don't sit down and write the story right now. Outline it and play around with that. And then you start the the writing process. Uh, There's a a woman uh, at my church who wants to uh, write her mother's memoir. Her mother has recently passed away and she wants to tell her mother's story. How do do I go about doing that? She asked me Sunday at church. (laughs) So so I told her, outline it. And, uh, you know, once she's got her outline done, I said, I'll take a look at it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is your website, this is something that's needed because there's a lot of people out there like that. And a lot of these experts, they just don't know how to package themselves either because now an expert has to have an entire platform. They've got to have that mailing list, the the people that they can send their newsletter to. They've got to have not just the book, but even the workbook that goes with the book so that they can hold seminars or, or online webinars and things like that. It's, it's all about integrating it, putting it together, and starting to build that audience for their message, and then creating whatever media goes along with it. They're going to do presentations. They might need a video to go with that. And all of that has to be pulled together by somebody like Matthew. And I'll bet you that's quite a daunting task with some of these people, isn't it, Matthew? Oh, it most certainly is. And I'm not going to lie, Stephen, it's a daunting task for me as well. Um, As I mentioned earlier, I don't pretend to be an expert in social media or in many of these other areas you just mentioned. I don't even pretend to like them. Um, But what I am good at at, is surrounding myself with folks who are good at it, right? So yourself and being with Fresh Ink Group. Um, I have cover designers, editors, social media specialists who work just with authors, public relations. Um, I have Jennifer Wilkov who – Uh, Her book is called Your Book is Your Hook, and she specializes in book launch. And I let my clients know up front that we have a very detailed onboarding process. And some of the first questions are, what do you want to get out of this? Who's your audience? Um, What is your goal? And then we set a strategy up front, like, I'm going to do the writing, but if you're looking to sell, 
a thousand copies in the first week and become an Amazon bestseller, you need to have these other pieces in place and these are things you need to think about. And I guide them through that whole process and I, and I kind of give them that warm handoff and introduction to the right people. But I've, I myself do not pretend to do it all. And I honestly think any ghostwriter who says that they can write it, edit it, market it, package it, um, if they can, there's somewhere they're not doing it as effectively because we we're all have our strengths. We all have the things that we do best. And I've yet to meet anyone in my life who can do every aspect of anything at the highest level. Yeah, yeah. I've talked. I've talked to a couple of authors who, who are trying to put together their, their uh, expertise platform too. And sometimes they act like, okay, I'm just going to tell you some stuff and then you're going to do all the work. And that doesn't work. The authors, the authors got to be roll up the sleeves, uh, roll up the pant legs, take off the shoes and socks and wade in and get right up in there in it and work with you. Um, I'm glad to, we got to meet Delbert. And again, Delbert, thank you for calling in. And we're going to look for you to call again next week. Uh, can you give us a shout out for another client or two that you got an example, somebody that you'd like to tout and put a name out there? Uh, well, I mean, my recent project that I finished is with a very good friend and colleague, Joe Rojas from Red Satan's, uh, also Helix Systems. He's a business coach and tech evangelist. And he came to me with a book half written, right? So I tell everyone, there's there's no one size fits all in ghostwriting, and this is his second book. He wrote his first book on his own, but his business has hit such a level that he just didn't have the time or the resources to get it out by the date he wanted it out. Um, and he and I worked together. We we set a deadline, and like you said, Stephen, there were realistic expectations on both sides. And one of the hardest parts as a ghostwriter is holding your client to task, and the guy who paid you. Um, and you're calling them, not asking for money, but calling them saying, hey, did you, did you do your end? Um, I, I need you to finish reading or I need you to do this in order for us to meet our deadline. And we, we pulled that in right under schedule. He's thrilled. He's referred me uh, to more people than I can count right now, other um, successful business entrepreneurs, people in the tech field who have been featured in dozens of magazines. Um, the newest client I just took on does 130 speaking engagements a year, but never thought to put a book out because it's just not his strong point. So now I'm helping him take all of that information that he talks around the country 130 times a year about and put it into a book. Great. Is that Rojas, R-O-J-A-S? Yes. Uh, tell us his name again. Uh, his name, Joe Rojas, J-O-E Joe. Rojas. And that's how he's that's how he's built. If people want to get out there and look for that book, and uh, maybe even Correct. see if they can attend one of his seminars, Joe Rojas, terrific. Yep. Now, listeners, yeah. I want to point out that uh, obviously Matthew knows what he's doing. Uh, if he hasn't established some credibility by now, then you're not paying attention. That's why we have invited him to become a member of G's Writer. Uh, we haven't talked about it on this show yet, but G's Writer is one of Freshman Group's arms including a website, and it's for experts and resources to help writers. And Matthew is going to be having his own dashboard sometime in the next week or so, and he'll post some material on there and be available through the G's Writer website as well as Pen for Hire in order to for people to help find him and maybe get some advice and, and consider working on a project with him. That's G'sWriter.com, G-E-E-Z-W-R-I-T-E-R.com, G'sWriter.com. Yeah, because uh, the thing about writing, if you, you may have a great story. It's not just about, well, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write this, and I'm going to put it up on Amazon and make a fortune. It doesn't work that way. There's so many different elements involved in it, and it's, it's always good to reach out and uh, Matthew knows what he's talking about. He, you've heard from one of his clients tonight. So, you know, keep that in mind. So how do people find you, Matthew? What's the best way to contact you, find you on social media? Uh, it's knock on your door there in New York. <laughs> I mean, hey, anyone's welcome to come knock on my door. I'm usually here locked in my basement office. But best way would be my website, tenforhirenyc.com. Uh, just like it sounds, P-E-N-F-O-R-H-I-R-E-N-Y-C.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Matthew Harms, and then Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, all as Pen for Hire. 
Pen for Hire, definitely. Okay. And those books, Pen again, employed, right. uh, employed, a career readiness manual, and Grow Up, No, Really. Make sure you get out there and find those books, too. Okay, we're going to have to wrap this up yeah. because we are pretty much out of time. Thank you, Matthew. We really appreciated you coming by, and we enjoyed talking to you and uh, meeting Delbert today. Thank you, Matthew. Same here. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I had a blast. And thank you to those who called in, including Delbert and uh, Nell Cooper. Thank you for calling in and uh, adding to the show. It's always always nice to have that uh that feedback from the audience. Thank you to uh, those on Twitter as well. Uh, Ver Wayne uh, Greenhoe and Robert G. Willis Cross, uh, two excellent writers in, of their own. So go out and look for them on Amazon as well. And uh, don't forget to go to the YouTube channel, subscribe, uh, go to the Freshing Group website. And at the bottom of the page, you can subscribe to the newsletter and uh, check it out. Great. We've got an invite out for next week's guest, but we haven't confirmed yet, so we're going to keep that a secret for now. We're about out of time. Thank you, Matthew, and we'll see everybody next week. You got it. Thank Thank you, you, everybody. Good night. You've been a part of Voice of Indy, a production of Fresh Ink Group. Spread the word, support our guests, then find us at freshinkgroup.com and be sure to hashtag Fresh Ink Group.